Hello, everyone. Today is Thursday, January 24, 2019, and this is the week in charts. I obviously want to thank everybody for being here. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm humbled by your presence. So what are we talking about? Well, current market conditions, obviously, and I have a lot to say about that. Your questions on trading, your favorite stock picks, and if you don't mind, keep your questions related to the slides while we're on the slides. Once we get to the live charts, you can ask anything you want. And when you ask about stocks, ask about an individual ticker at a time. I know a lot of tickers. I don't know all of them, but make sure you put the ticker in versus the company name. Hit return. That way I can make sure they all get covered. You can ask about as many as you want, but just one at a time if you don't mind. So what do we can talk about? Well, I want to talk about acrasia and why you do the wrong thing and how to stop doing that. And that's going to make a lot more sense in just a few minutes. And, of course, we have a bear market update i think this market should roll over but so far it hasn't we'll get to that i also want to follow up on the tfm system there's been some confusion there and i myself even got a little confused about a few things anyway that was a disclaimer screen as you, yeah as you know you can lose money trading disclaimer screen easy for me to say as often summing up all pictures about the future and a lot of stuff could happen between now and then thank you greg morris for let me steal that line. Let's talk about the acrasia effect when it comes to trading psychology. Now, before we get into that, what often amazes me is that with the trading psychology, the Y's, W-H-Y-S, eventually becomes the Y's. It's like this onion where you just keep working on it and working on it, peeling back the layers, and you begin to understand why you are encouraged to do the wrong thing, why you feel tempted to do the wrong thing, why you often do the wrong thing. And you sort of have to force yourself not to. We're going to get into a lot of that in just one second. And in time, you will learn why you have those feelings and why it is normal. One example that I often talk about is I took a personality test and I scored extremely low in agreeableness and even more extremely low in modesty. I scored a zero in modesty. I was a little embarrassed to put this up. It's like, eh, you know what? Let me just show everything warts and all. Now, I forget which book it was. It might have been written by Larry Williams' son, but it's a book on trading psychology. I have it buried here somewhere. I've been trying to move and still run a business. Difficult, as you would imagine. But I think I think it might have been Larry Williams' son that wrote the book. And one thing he suggested was take a personality test. And that was a bit of an epiphany, a bit of an eye-opener for me. And when I told my wife about this, she kind of laughed at me. Wife and kids are both looking at me like, I'm crazy. Like I've walked into Starbucks and asked for a cup of coffee. You know, <laughs> that look they give you. If you walk into Starbucks, ask for a cup of coffee. Look at you like you pooch your pants. Anyway, point is, it was kind of an eye-opener for me. And that's because... I expect everyone to agree with me. And obviously, as I often say, your personal life will spill into your trading and trading will spill into personal life. Or I should also say your personality is going to come out in your trading. There's been many of people, many people out there, such as Douglas, I think would be one of them, probably a good example, talks about how your personality comes out within your trading. And you have to kind of guard against that in some cases. In some cases, it could be a positive some cases, not so much. So again, as my wife and kids will attest, I'm not a very agreeable person. Now, 0% in modesty means that it says here, modest people don't like to brag or show off. Well, I want to, I, I feel that urge to say, look at me, look at how great I am, look at what I'm doing. And I have to kind of obviously rein that back in when it comes to the markets. And one thing to realize, which kind of ties into this whole acrasia thing, is that you have to realize that good traders are humble. And the reason I threw this slide in here sort of last minute was lately it seems like a new flock of gurus has come out and they seem to be well funded and they're spending millions and millions of dollars on advertisement. In fact, if you're watching a recording of this on YouTube, there is a chance that one of those advertisers, I'd say probably a 99% chance, one of those advertisers is going to advertise at the beginning of this video. And, and I'll actually make, I don't know, 25 cents or something. 
off of that ad. So they're out there. I didn't personally endorse that person, but they do just kind of buy up all this ad space out there. So along those lines, it's kind of been irking me a little bit. But you have to realize that these guys can sort of creep into your own psyche. And even I, not that I'm the grand poobah, but someone like me who understands that there is no holy grail, there are no secrets, I find it kind of aggravating. And in the back of my mind, I'm wondering, well, what do they know that I don't? And every now and then, I'll watch a little bit of one of the webinars just to see if they do. And usually they don't. A lot of times it's like, well, you just sell options. Then you just sell some more options. Like, okay, well, that'll work until it don't. Anyway, a good trader doesn't post his P&Ls. And I found it interesting recently on YouTube. I saw where somebody was actually kind of picking apart those P&Ls and pointing out that they actually were Photoshopped. So that's a that's another story in and of itself. There's a part of me that wants to go out there and and I don't want to say expose, but find out how wrong these guys are. And then there's another part of me realize I'm just wasting my time. And that's the micro versus macro thing that we're going to talk about in just one second that could be keeping me from my goal or keeping you from your goal too. They don't brag about what they made and it's not even noon. Hey, I just sit in this cafe and I just made $10,000, haven't had breakfast yet or whatever, you know, whatever. And they don't post pictures of themselves standing in front of Lamborghinis. <laughs> How'd that get in there? You know, it's funny. It's like, <laughs> I think I said this before. But people are like, why did you call you Big Dave? It's like, well, this is not a matchbox car. This is a real car. <laughs> look at me and look at the car. Anyway, Steve Pressfield wrote a book called The War of Art, obviously a play on words of the art of war. And I like what he wrote in there. The counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident, and the real one is scared to death. As I was going live with this, I was just thinking about my friends who run hundreds of billions, hundreds of millions, and in some cases, billions of dollars. And I've seen their funds before when they go through a drawdown. I think to myself, like, I wonder what they're thinking. Well, I know what they're thinking. They're probably thinking, oh, shoot. <laughs> and they're probably saying something a little worse than that. How do I get out of this drawdown? How far is it going to go? How do I get out of it? Or I should say, when do I get out of it? And so on and so forth. Well, Reading this book a couple of years ago made me feel pretty normal. So why? Now, I do get a little cocky here and there because of the agreeableness thing rears its ugly head. And I'll have a few successful trades in a row or a few big trades. And I feel kind of smart and that I find myself falling into bad habits, being sucked into doing something or at least tempted to do something that I shouldn't. But usually that ego goes away really, really quickly. So the counterfeit innovator is wildly self-confident. The real one is scared to death. So if you ever feel like somebody knows something that you don't when it comes to markets, provided you've studied markets carefully and you're not just winging it, then you could rest assured that they don't. Now, getting back to acrasia, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from a gentleman by the name of James Clear who wrote The Atomic Habits or Atomic Habits. And I think the original blog post, if I had to guess, probably came from Charlie Kirk's The Kirk Report. That's probably where I found that. And I was just looking for some other things yesterday, the day before in Evernote, and I found this article on Acrasia. According to Google, the definition of acrasia is the state of mind in which someone acts against their better judgment through weakness of will. Now, Mr. Clear defines it as the state of acting against your better judgment. It is when you do one thing, even though you know you should do something else. Acrasia is what prevents you from following through on what you set out to do. Now, one of the things that comes with acrasia or the reason that we are susceptible to acrasia is that we have a time inconsistency. So we all want this immediate gratification. And it's hard to focus on that longer term goal. Now, I like to drink beer. I used to have a microbrewery in the garage. The only reason I sold it was because we're moving and we wanted to downsize. And then 
I would reevaluate whether or not I want to still be a brewer when I'm done, but I like beer that much. And I know that the instant gratification I get when I drink a couple of beers is going to be very nice, but longer term, it's going to make Big Dave even bigger. So we're, none of us are immune to that immediate gratification versus longer term goals. They're very tangible and rewarding. So when you're thinking about micromanaging yourself out of that good trade and locking in that profit, when you mentally monetize those profits and think, you know what, I'm just going to lock that in. And then, of course, you watch in anguish as the position takes off without you. But over the short term, it can be very tangible and rewarding. Also, when you are feeling these, I hate to use the word gambling type of things, but just a couple of days ago, I was looking into these short-term options on a triple leveraged inverse fund, something kind of stupid, right? Not a derivative on a derivative on a derivative, but they seem kind of cheap to me, these out-of-the-money ones. And for a split second or two, I started thinking, well, I can buy a few thousand contracts maybe, and if it pays off, it'll be tens of thousands of dollars. And then I came to my senses as my well, might as well just go flush that money down the toilet, the chances of it paying off or Slim and Nine, and Slim just left town. So there is a bit of that instant rush or dopamine effect, the thing that, that gets gamblers. We have that in our head, so we get that dopamine. And it makes us want to, to do this bad behavior. Unfortunately, it comes with a longer-term cost. If you drink beer, you're going to get fatter. I know. Shocking. I have proof. Now, one of my problems with all the behavioral science, behavioral finance, they all kind of just beat the dead horse, say the same thing. So I don't know where this originally came from, but one way to explain a time inconsistency, this propensity that we have, is that if I offer you $500 a day or $500 to $5 tomorrow, more than likely you're like, yeah, give me $500. Sounds good to me. But if I say, well, what if in 365 days I'll give you $500? Or in 366 days, I'll give you $505. The majority of people will take the $505. Although you could argue that they're the same. It's just a one day difference between the 500 and the 505. Well, one thing that they, I think they fail to sort of talk about when they do talk about all these little examples is that psychologically, you probably also wondering there's probably like a little bit of a bird in the hand thing going through your head too they kind of gloss over that but getting back to their example if you knew for a fact you would get to 500 dollars a day or 505 tomorrow or 500 a year from now or 505 a year and a day from now and there was there was no question whether or not there was a bird in the hand type of thing then again most people would choose $500 a day and $505 a year and a day from now when presented with those options. Now, modern society has put pressures upon us. We live in a so-called microwave society. When's the last time you drove to a video store to rent a video? Well, it's probably been a year because no video stores exist anymore. As I often joke, there was a video store that made it up until maybe a year or two ago. And I wondered if they were selling crack or something. I wonder if it was some sort of laundering, money laundering or front or whatever. Now, these easy money gurus aren't really helping us. And that's where I kind of went off onto that tangent earlier about these idiots that are out there that are saying all these things. And I, as somebody pointed out on Facebook recently, how are they getting away with it? Why hasn't the SEC investigated? I guess the SEC is just too busy. And I keep thinking it's going to happen to some of these guys. And I was in Vegas a few years back, and we were talking about one individual in particular that sure looked like he was going to be in sheep dip, but somehow they just keep, <laughs> they just avert the SEC. I don't know how. But anyway, these guys, before I digress too far, I know too late. These guys certainly aren't helping, making you feel like you can make all this money today. In fact, you don't even have to wait to lunch. Now, with trading psychology, I vacillate from going into like a deep dive into trading psychology, into neurology, and coming back to all you have to do. Like my wife often says, all you have to do is go 
with your wrench and fix this leaky faucet. Well, usually two or three trips to the plumbing store, some cussing, some fussing. You know, I judge jobs on how many F-bombs I drop to them. You know, that's a 10 F-bomb job. You would think it'd be a zero F-bomb job. F-bomb job. That's hard to say. You know, just my wife, all you got to do. Well, and that happens to me all the time. And I am pretty handy, but she goats me into a lot of things. <laughs> and I end up spending way more time. The example I used a while back in one of the columns was that she's like, all you got to do is go with the trimmers to those hedges at the front of the property. Well, when we got there, we got out there, we found out it was a lot more to it. There was an overgrown fence and all kinds of trouble. And we ended up taking a ground zero approach. I ended up doing burnouts in the front on the front street, trying to pull hedges out. And it just became a much bigger deal. But getting back to trading, all you have to do is just follow your plan. All you have to do is resist these urges and just do what? Follow your plan. Well, of course, you have to plan your trade ahead of time too, but that's all you have to do. But the good news when it comes to all this, and this is where, again, I vacillate between a deep dive into neurology and trading psychology and all this stuff to show you the wise, to make you wise, W-I-S-E, to all you have to do. And you know what you're doing wrong. And that is the greatest thing, the greatest secret when it comes to trading psychology. By the way, trading... It's not easy, but it's not nearly as difficult as most people try to make it. Follow a simple system, and of course, you might have a little discretion here and there, but for the most part, follow a si simple system, plan your trade, trade your plan, that's pretty much it. And if you've been doing this for a little while, chances are pretty damn good that you know what you're doing wrong. Now, I didn't put the slides in here, but throughout the years, I have gotten confession after confession after confession from people because they know what they're doing wrong. And Jeff, Jesse Livermore, which it's always interesting. I'll read about something, learn about something, and then I'll go read one of these old classics on Wall Street, such as Reminiscence of a Stop, Stock Operator by Jesse Livermore. And I'll say that, well, this is covered a long time ago. A stock speculator sometimes makes mistakes and knows that he is making them. That's true. Now, getting back to original thought, which is kind of interesting, is as I was doing a little research on Acrasia, I began thinking, well, that kind of reminds me of Paul the Apostle. And the reason that I thought about that was because somebody emailed me once and said, Dave, you know, that passage from Paul, I know not to do, but I keep doing it. Paul, in various translations, I do it anyway. I do what is wrong. I know it's wrong. I do it anyway. And that actually became the genesis of column. So I did look up Romans from Paul and it was, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what is wrong, but I do it anyway. And I found it interesting as I'm thinking, well, this Socrasia thing sounds like Paul's problem. And then I did a little research and come to find out that's one of the big examples that they use. So it's kind of like the doctor, doctor joke. It hurts when I do this. Well, you know, solution is simple. Don't do that. I know, easier said than done. Which brings us to commitment. And commitment will help you to overcome the acrasia. Commitment is whatever it is that makes a person engage or continue a course of action when difficulties or positive alternatives influence the person to abandon the action. Think about trading. How many perceived positive alternatives are there? Well, you get into a trade, it starts going against you a little bit. Your stop's a long ways away, so you got to follow that plan. Then it goes a little bit more against you, a little bit more against you, and then eventually stops you out. Well, you're thinking, dang it, why didn't I just get out when I had a small loss? Well, as I preach and beat the dead horse on, the market is a bad teacher. So you get out at that small first little sign of adversity. And by the way, there's always going to be some signs of adversity, that I can guarantee, then you'll never achieve your longer-term goal of capturing longer-term gains, and you'll never become a success in trading. I know, it's easier said than done. Same thing happens with the micromanagement on the upside. You want to lock in that loss. You want to mentally monetize that money. And all of these influences will tempt you to abort 
the longer term plan. The shorter term plan, which so you can achieve your longer term goals in a longer term plan. Now, one way to solve for these short term temptations, whether it's a crazy year, is to use some sort of commitment device. Do the right thing in the future by making bad habits difficult in the present. One example that I often give here is if you truly are committed to do something, then you need to figure out a way to hold yourself accountable. And I talk a lot about that in prior presentations, obviously. One example that I use, which is pretty good, I think, is a trader friend of mine, good trader, good guy, nice guy, and not that that's relevant, but He's become a little pudgy because of this sedentary lifestyle that we have found ourselves in, and he wanted to get in shape. So what he did was he found a kid who was a fitness advocate, and I'm guessing that the kid probably could use some money. So he said, here's the deal. I'll pay your gym membership. I'll pay your gas. And if I'm not sitting on my front porch, and I forget whether it's 6 a.m. or whatever it was, a couple hours before the market opens, wherever he is, if I'm not sitting on my front porch at 6 a.m. when you drive by, then I will pay you $20 for every day that I do that. So this kid is incentivized to do something that he would do anyway, so he's going to be there. But this friend of mine, he's held accountable, and it's going to cost him $20. So you have to find some sort of commitment device to sort of hold your feet to the fire. Now, when you feel the siren call of day trading, by the way, it's kind of interesting, they use Ulysses as their example, and I'm often saying the siren call of day trading. It's kind of interesting how it dovetail, it dovetails back in with this Acrasia thing, because Ulysses, as you know, tied himself to the mast and put wax in all of his crew's ears so they wouldn't wreck the boat from the siren call of the sirens, I guess. <laughs> so when you feel that siren call of day trading, micromanaging, or anything outside of your plan or core methodology, and again, if you've been studying trading for a little while, it doesn't take that long to come up with a little bit of a methodology that you can follow, something simple, I should say, not a little bit, but it's something simple and not too complex, then you know when you're doing the wrong thing. Now, as I often say, sometimes it's as easy as turning off your screens. Go for a walk. Not all the time, but many times I get really pissed off. Want to take some adverse action, even though it's outside of my plan. And as I say ad nauseum, I go for a walk, come back, and a lot of times the market is turned around. Not all the time. I mean, if it was true, then I'd be the fittest guy in Fit Town because I'd be doing a lot of walking. But the point is that I often waste a lot of mental energy and I know I'm putting myself into that one state of regret and to a state of temptation. And if you stay in a state of temptation long enough, and we don't have to give any examples here, but I think you could probably think of a few examples from other people, not yourself, of course. But if you stay in that state of temptation long enough, you eventually will cave in. And that's just human nature. Now, one thing you could do is take your wife or significant other to lunch. Obviously, you don't want to take both at the same time to the same place, but you get the idea. I'm kidding, obviously. I guess that joke's getting old. But what had me thinking about this was a couple of weeks ago, not that I don't still do stupid things, but a couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting here and I found myself watching every tick. And I felt myself very interested in possibly firing off a day trade when it wasn't something that I would normally do. Now, day trade, when do I day trade? Well, Ideally, I hold myself accountable and only day trade if I have like a nice big opening gap reversal or something. But I know if I sit there and watch every little tick, that little intraday trend or what I perceive as an intraday trend looks a lot bigger than it really is. Now, again, I'm not perfect, but what I did a couple of weeks ago was I found myself looking at the screen. My wife's like, what do you want to do for lunch? I'm like, you know what? Let's go to lunch. Turned off my screen and went to lunch. Physically removing yourself from the situation, that's a commitment device. Lately, I've been trying to make something happen. There hasn't been a whole lot of setups. If you've been following along the service, you'll know that. But I know I have to continue to grind it out every day by doing my research after the market closes. But I got to be careful not to try to make something happen intraday that's not there outside of the plan. So if you have to physically remove 
yourself. I think it was Sakota who once said having a slot machine, I'm sorry, having a quote machine on your desk is like having a slot machine on your desk. You're going to eventually be inclined to feed it. Now, one of the things I've been thinking about quite a bit lately, and I don't know if it's Tim Ferriss, read, uh, reading Tim Ferriss has gotten me into these kicks or what, but i really been thinking a lot about the micro as opposed to the macro. And the micro is more important than the macro. What you're going to do in the next six, sec six seconds or six minutes is vitally important. And you have to realize that, obviously, something you do over a very short period of time can still have a long-lasting impact on your life, both good and bad, okay? But the micro, obviously, in a lot of cases, is a lot more important than the macro. So if you're taking a trade you shouldn't take, stop and don't take that trade. I know, easier said than done. But longer term, that's going to create bad habits. As I often say, you can't get a little bit pregnant. And it's going to take you away from your longer term goal. So along those lines, you really have to be goal oriented. Now, keep in mind, in order to be goal oriented, you also, in this business, you have to be process oriented. We talked recently in the members Q&A a lot about someone who had a fixed percentage goal per week to trade, which is great and motivational, I'm sure, but it kind of opens up a can of worms of a whole host of potential psychological problems. So rather than do that, just be process oriented and follow the process. And I think it was in Market Wizards or somewhere, the money comes as sort of like an afterthought. So what I often say is with every action, every micro action, are you moving toward or away from your goal? So think about this graphic when you're tempted to follow the greed and fear. So again, not that I'm perfect in my execution, but I think it was yesterday, the day before, again, I was looking at these stupid out of the money options and thinking about how much money I could make. And then it's like that little voice inside of my head was saying, you know what you're doing wrong. So instead, you have to think about following the process. So when you seem like you're, when you're feeling that urge, let me start over. When you're feeling that urge to micromanage, that means exit a stock before your stop is hit. Exit a stock before the trailing stop is hit. Take small profits and not let your profits ride, and so on and so forth. Again, you know what you're doing wrong. Recognize that that is pushing you away from your goal. Following the process is being patient. Well, how do you be patient? Well, you might have to put a commitment device in place. You might have to turn your screen off, walk out of your office. Now, following the process, you're picking the best stocks. Following greed and fear, you're trading for activity. Buying a bunch of out-of-the-money options is a bad idea, but I'm trading for excitement and activity if I hit that enter button. Following the process means you're honoring your stop. Following the greed and fear means you hope and hold. So if you are being held hostage to that feeding fear and greed, you're likely to abandon the plan as opposed to just following the process. I know, all you gotta do. So how do you overcome a crazy? It seems like I did a pretty good job as I often do at defining a problem, so how do we get to the solution to that problem? Well, 
again, it all comes down to the micro versus the macro. Your, without getting too deep into neuroscience, your emotional part of your brain, down the limbic system, your amygdala and all that is very fast action acting, which is necessary to keep you alive. Unfortunately, you can make snap decisions because of that. You can be held hostage to a much smaller part of your brain as opposed to the rest of what's sloshing around up there. And sometimes, as I often preach, it only takes a few seconds to bypass that emotional or super emotional part of your brain. So it might be as simple as breathing, thinking about what you are tempted to do, be cognizant. That's another big word that I like to use, or somewhat big word. Cognizant, three words, that's just three syllables. But be cognizant of your actions. Think about your actions. Journal your actions. And you want to journal your emotions especially. And in my trading journal, which has become more of an emotional journal this year because the brokerage tracks all the trades, it's I put a, a little column in there for which I call shame, okay? So if I do something I'm not supposed to be doing, I click off the little shame button or I click off the little shame, the little box that says, okay, this is outside of the methodology. Why am I doing that? So if you feel like you must take some sort of action outside of your core methodology and you actually do it, then make sure you write down why you did that and especially your emotions in doing that. As Charlie Kirk said, and I swore I would stop the last week at Van Camp, but as Charlie said back in St. Lucia, I guess about a month ago, he said, a little bit over a month ago, anyway, he said, if you do keep breaking those rules and you keep doing those little day trades or whatever, then set up a separate account and do those day trades and then take it one step further, compare that to just following your core methodology at the end of the year and see how you did. Now, the problem with that, as many of you have pointed out, and I see both sides of the argument, is that you can't get a little bit pregnant. And I hear you on that. In other words, once you start those bad behaviors, it could get worse and worse. But again, in every action, just ask yourself, are you moving toward or away from your goal, your longer term goal? Now, keep in mind that micro can have lasting effects. And that goes for life and trading. If you say something you shouldn't to the wrong person in a snap, then those emotions might go away fairly quickly for you, but that person might have a very long memory and it could have long lasting effects on your life. So in trading the same thing, the micro can have long lasting effects. And I think where I'm going with this is it's kind of like if you keep doing small things that you shouldn't do, you're going to create that habit of doing things that you shouldn't do. All right, any questions, thoughts, amusing anecdotes on Acrasia? <laughs> All right, if you haven't already done so, I would encourage you to take the market timing course. I am going to go over the TFM system in a little more detail this week because I seem to be getting a lot of questions on it. But it is all there. If you go and take the free market timing course, you'll get that. If you don't see this banner ad on my website because it does change in time, go to members and you could get started for free in the members area. Feedback has been phenomenal. And thank you guys for that. I see a few of you here that have gone through a lot of the information there. And I keep adding to it constantly. So check it out. And I'll talk a little bit about that in just one second. Now, my reoccurring theme since the market became a little iffy is winter is coming. And then it sure did seem like winter is here. And now I'm wondering if it's temporarily delayed. When we get to the live charts, we'll talk more about that. Now, getting a lot of questions on this TFM 
nearly simplest system in the world. And I was wondering, why am I getting these questions on it? Well, number one, if you do go through the market timing course, it's laid out pretty clearly there. But I myself became a little bit confused because somebody pointed out that we're closing in on a signal. And I'm like, that can't be right, a buy signal. And then I looked at it. I was like, wait a minute, maybe it is. And I realized I wasn't using a weekly moving average. So even though it's a simple system, there are a few rules to remember. Number one, you want to buy when two lows are greater than the 50-week moving average. And when we get to the live charts, we'll take a look at that. In other words, you want upside Landry light and the market is near C. C is with C is 10%. Within 10% of the closing highs, the 50-week closing highs. Okay, so right about one year round numbers, closing highs. You want to stay long as long as the market is near C. Now, it has to be adjusted to the market's volatility. I have not gone out because somebody said, well, Dave, I'm looking at the TFM system in this biotech or whatever company it was. And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. You have to adjust to the market's volatility. I thought 10% is a good round number, especially for something like the S&P 500, based on the volatility of the market. And we use 50 week and that should be closing highs and say, look, I'm, I'm tripping myself up here too. And you want to sell the sell short when the market is greater than 10% away from C and closes below, below the 50 week moving average. So we're not waiting for that moving average to have, we're not waiting for the price to have Landry like with the moving average. We're simply looking for a close below on the short side since the market's, tend to implode a lot faster than they go up. They take the escalator up and the elevator down. So let's take a look at what that looks like yet again. So this is a weekly chart. It's going to be very hard for you to see it. But if you look down in the right corner, it's going to say weekly down here. So you want to stay short as long as the market is 10% or greater away from the 50-week closing high. And you want to go long when you have one, two periods of daylight and you're less than 10% away from the 50-week closing high. Okay. So the line that I have drawn here at 10 is 10%, greater than 10%, less than 10%. And then there you have two periods of daylight. So that would be your buy. So this is would be a short signal. Notice that this market, and I think this is like the crash of 1929. But notice that this market for a long, long time, you had Landry Light here. Okay. I keep changing the name of it. Somebody pointed out that I should call it Landry Light, so we'll call it Landry Light. And two things happened. One the market went more than 10% away. So this would be the 50 week closing high here. Well, right here, that's 10% away from here to here is 10%. Okay. And it closed below the 50 week moving average. The whole theory of the system is technical analysis 101. If you have A, B and C and C is above B, and B's above A. Then you want to be long as long as the market is near C. 
and you want to be short when the market begins to drop away from C, approaches B. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's a whole theory. Now, the reason I come up with these type of super simple systems is when there's some sort of market action that could require some sort of action <laughs> or something happened in the market that might inspire you to do something either emotionally or otherwise, such as a hot IPO, or I should say not a hot IPO, but a well-hyped IPO, sometimes I'll come up with something really simple and it'll stick. Like the, what did I call that? I guess I don't even have a name for it, but I need to come up with better names for my stuff. But the little Landry light -like system with the IPOs where, okay, well, you could buy the IPO, but you have to have daylight or, or I should say Landry light -like, above the five period moving average. And it has to close at a new closing high. And it also has to close above the high of day one. That's the whole system. That's it. And you're going to be shocked at how many stinkers it'll keep you out of when it comes to the IPOs and how many good positions it'll put you into. And that's all under the IPO session, section under methodology. Anyway, the point is I come up with a system, simple system like that just to see if something simple and somewhat tangible can keep you out of trouble and maybe keep you from being tempted to do the wrong thing. So, again, the sell signal comes in when the market is 10% or more away from the 50-week closing highs. And it closes below the 50-week moving average. Now, this is what it looks like a little bit longer term. You could see major sells and buys. You know, here's the deal. I mean, I'm proud of this system. Don't get me wrong. But pick your favorite system. Pick your favorite moving average, okay? And look at a weekly chart. Bow ties. You like bow ties? That'll work pretty damn good on a weekly basis. This silly little system, believe it or not, works pretty damn good and keep you on the right side of the market. You can see the major buy and sell signals with this. And in recent times, we had another sell signal, obviously, as the market has begun to slide. So that major sell signal will stay in effect until and unless we get a reverse signal. That doesn't mean that if you did take some signal like that, that you, would not, that you wouldn't want to apply some type of money management to it. And when we look at the actual charts, I'll flesh it out in one second. Now, again, just real quick, as I've been saying quite a bit, over the years, I've had the privilege of working with thousands of you guys. And in more recent years, I realized that I probably could have been a lot more efficient. And one example I gave was one individual that I worked with quite a bit. And in more recent times, I told him something, and he didn't know that that was part of the methodology. It's something to do with money management. And it made me realize that maybe I'm not as efficient as I should be. And the extreme other example was someone who just asked me questions for 10 years, and then I said, look, you just need to get the first book and reread that and just follow this one or two little things. He's like, well, I've been meaning to get that. Well, you got to put a little skin in the game. you got to invest in yourself. So for those who truly want to be helped – I put together this learning management system and I can track the progress and you can track your progress. More important, it's more important for you to track your progress, to hold yourself accountable. And then to me to, to assume more of a coaching position. And if there's something that's missing in here, then you just ask the question and we'll cover it in detail in the Q and a, but anyway, the response has been really great to this and I'm pretty excited. And my ultimate goal would be to graduate everyone up, into a bit of a mastermind group. And we're beginning to see that a little bit in the Facebook group. There's only a few of us in there right now, but it's fairly active to my surprise in catching on. And I've gotten a few good trades out of that group already. So I would encourage you to become a member and then of course join the Facebook group and we can discuss things in real time. And I participate there quite often. And then answers requiring thought, I bring over to the Q&A session. And a lot of you guys have been very happy with the Q and A's, and I want to make it feel like I want to make you feel like I'm here for you, 
and you're going, you're going to get your questions answered. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and shift gears. Any questions? Quite a bunch today. I guess you guys already know all these things, huh? All right, so let me get my chart set up. What I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about this system first, this TFM system, and then I want to talk about market conditions and why we are on temporary hold for the bear market. And then, obviously, we'll open it up to individual questions. So let me get a decent-sized chart here. Okay, let's start off. Let's take a look at the P's first. Now, where I, where I became confused was we were talking about the system in the Facebook group, and they're like, "Hey, Dave, we're more we're less than ten percent away from the fifty week closing high," and we were. Okay, back on the 18th. And my point was that you need two bars, and we only had one above the 50-day moving average. Well, as I said earlier, that's supposed to be a 50-week moving average. So my bad on that. I was wondering why we would have such a quick signal so fast. The one thing that I want to mention, as I've talked a little bit about before, when it comes to a system, you need some sort of whipsaw filter built in, but you got to be careful not to build in too many whipsaw filters. Because one thing it'll do is, let's say you have some sort of filter that keeps you from getting along, well, the market goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up, goes up, and your filter eventually says, okay, it's time to buy. Well, by then, the trend might be over with. So you got to be really careful. And the other thing that too many whipsaw filters will do is it you could end up with a complex system that curve fits itself to prior markets. So that's where you have to be careful with the whipsaws. But even with my own system, my confusion was, okay, it's the weekly moving average. Now, what did I just say a few minutes ago? Something like Dave-like, lows greater than the moving average can, and can be a keyword in that sentence, help to keep you on the right side of the market. Okay? So what do we have now? Well, we have downside Dave-like. So, yeah, we might be within 10% of that closing high, but we also have to have two lows above the moving average. So that's the whipsaw filter. All right, so let's take a measurement off of that closing high to where we are now. 985. Okay, so we're less than 10% away, but again, we don't have the whipsaw filter there. So let's go back to that weekly just real quick. When you look at the weekly chart, it really does give you some perspective. You could see that we could just be in the early phases of breaking down in here. And by the way, one thing I'm thinking about, too, is as Greg Morris says, and as I often preach, treat all signals as if they will, will become the big one, Elizabeth implied. Now, why is the bear market on hold? Well, I'm a little baffled that, number one, we had this huge upthrust. Now, that doesn't baffle me, but the fact that this market is staying overbought and not coming off that overbought situation in a meaningful way tells me that at least temporarily the slide has stopped. Now, that in and of itself is a reason to get long, but it might be a reason to make sure you honor your stops on any shorts and things like that. To me, the obvious move still remains lower. I mean, put in your favorite indicators. Let's take a look at bow ties. And yeah, they're improving shorter term, but take a look at like the weekly ones. And they're still in downtrend proper order for now. But so far, the market is just hanging in there. So got to be very careful not to fight it. I've been a little guilty of fighting it because I think that trend still remains down. So I have to be really careful there. Let's take a look at the Rusty 
And then let's take a look at a few sectors in here. First of all, let's take a look at the comp. So NASDAQ composite retrace back up to that overhead supply. Let's throw the 50 in there for S&Gs. And we are back above the 50-day moving average. Nothing magical about that, but I do find it a little interesting. Let's take a look at the weekly. On a weekly basis, this sure looks like a market that's still in trouble. Big thrust down followed by a pullback. It gives you a heck of a lot of perspective. And again, like we just said, with the P's, take a look at your Landry light. I'm amazed. I know. How could something so simple actually work? Go back in and watch the week of charts from several months ago where I talked a lot about that Landry light in longer term market timing. Go through the market timing course while you're at it. And you can see this run we've had from 2012. It got a little dicey here in 15, 16. And it's okay to get out the way. He who fights and runs away, what? Lives to fight another day. But you can see we had a nice run in here, and now it looks like it might be done longer term. What is the market doing shorter term? Well, it's hanging in here and kind of going up. Let's take a look at the Rusty. Rusty's back above its 50-day moving average and pushing into this overhead supply. Back to chart out a little bit, and boy, that sure looks like a top to me. But is the market going down? Well, not lately. But look at that, 23% round number, so 24%. Might be a little worse than that, and that's on a closing basis. Media defines a bear market where? 20%. So Rusty is at a bear market by that metric at least. But now bumping up against overhead supply, the obvious move would be lower. Now, what did Linda Rasky say? I did see it attributed, I think it was in the Kirk report, to something similar was attributed to Walter Deemer. And but basically the market will do the most obvious thing in the most unobvious manner. And a corollary that Linda also said was it will do what it has to do to frustrate the most people or fool the most people, fool and trick the most people. And I asked Linda about that, and she said it's just some stuff she probably heard on the floor, and she didn't even remember saying it. So, But I give her credit because that's where I heard it first. Anyway, so this thing is obviously going to roll over. What, it's, what is it going to do first? It's going to push into this overhead supply, make everybody think it's the all clear, and then it's going to roll over, okay? Now, I don't know that for a fact, but that's what it will likely do to frustrate the most people. And if you think about the psychological, the psychology of the market, excuse me, psychology of the market, and that's, let's be frank here, that's what we're doing with technical analysis. We're not doing some crazy wave counting or Fibonacci, or something like that. We're basically looking at the charts to try to figure out what actions people have done in the past and what actions based on the charts they might be inclined to do. I am a man on a street kind of guy. My phone's been lighting up lately. People are opening up their 401ks and finding out they're turned into, they've turned into 201ks and they're beginning to get a little nervous. And then a few weeks later, now people are beginning to breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, it's coming back. It's coming back. Those are is that three or four words. <laughs> it's coming back. Three words. Three dangerous words <laughs> for the buy and hope people. But what's going to happen is, okay, they were nervous, and then now they're feeling a little bit better. And if things keep coming up, coming back, you know, they may have dodged a bullet. Well, they've been trained by the market to do the wrong thing, but that's another story in and of itself. But if the market does begin to slide after re this big retracement here, this big sort of, hey, water's fine, come on in, rally then I think everybody's going to run for the door at the same time. But so far, that hasn't happened, okay? Now, as you go through these sectors, same sort of action, sharp retraces up, usually around the 50-day moving average or so. But longer term, as you can see, the downtrends do remain in place in most of these, and they're fairly solid downtrends. And what's amazing is even – some of these efficient, I'm sorry, not efficient, but yeah, efficient markets. Some of these efficient markets and more importantly, defensive markets such as the foods, you can see sure look like they're still 
in a lot of trouble. So we didn't really get that flight to safety that you think you would get in a bear market. Now, banks are kind of interesting. They're plow they plowed through the first level of overhead supply, but now they've got another mountain of overhead supply to get to. So this is why I'm not too excited to rush out and buy the banks, at least not just yet. But as you go through these, again, sharp retraces into mountains of overhead supply. Real estate is kind of a good example of a potentially dangerous chart. I don't like bottoms at tops. Very dangerous way to trade. So what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of people are emailing me and asking questions about, well, you know, market could bow tie up soon or it's bow tying up. Well, it's not bow tying off of major, major lows. It's bow tying off of recent lows. And if you have a market that looks like this longer term and has this V-shaped recovery, it can be kind of dangerous because by the time the market gets all the way back to its prior highs, it's already very overbought and very hard to mount a new leg on top of a no one. Drugs might be a little bit better example of that. They plowed through this overhead supply for the most part, but they didn't make it to brand new highs. And it's just kind of dangerous to rush out and start buying a market that looks like that. So I'm in a very much show me type of mode. And again, let's just go through the rest of these real quick. Let's see if there's anything interesting. But most of these areas, again, just strong retraces. But I wouldn't rush out and start buying them just yet. Transport's a little wide and loose, but same sort of action there, too. And again, maybe take a look at the weekly in some of these cases. And the weekly sure looks a lot more uglier than that daily chart. The daily chart, you get kind of sucked into this little rally. But the weekly, so far at least, it looks like it's in a lot of trouble. There's hardware, otherwise known as Apple. I don't know if Phil's here or not, but Phil will probably point out it's retraced at 50 due to turn back down. That's possible. Anyway, as you go through these, again, just strong retraces. And let's take a look at the XLF because it's a little bit better representation of financials. So financials, strong retrace. Mountain of overhead supply. If it gets through that, then it has another mountain of overhead supply to overcome. Now, this doesn't mean that I won't buy a stock right now. It just has to be one charming stock. And right now, I'm still seeing a few of these IPOs that are looking interesting. Also, I'm seeing some speculative issues beginning to bottom out and turn around and form bow ties and first thrusts and things like that off of major, major, major lows. So I will be putting some longs on here and there, but as far as buying the overall market, I don't think it's time to do that. It's not time to buy stocks in general and as usual, but especially now you want to pick your spots really carefully. All right. I have pontificated way too much. Any questions on anything? If, if you guys want to start asking and girls want to start asking about individual stocks, do so now. People like to look at things like goals. So let's take a look at that real quick while we're waiting on questions to come in. Yeah, Mike, I was looking at that one. We'll talk about that one in one second. So gold has had a nice run up in here. It's pretty impressive. My only problem is this is gold, the commodity. It has a bunch of overhead supply to deal with like everything else. And it's also had a pretty serious run. And once again, it's kind of like a, a bottom at a top, it's still at least multi years, it's coming off these highs and still looks somewhat questionable, as opposed to coming off of major lows like 2013 14 was coming off of like five or 10 year lows. It looked a lot better than as opposed to this recent little rally in here stuck in the middle of this range. Okay, Mike, let's talk about TME as an IPO setup. I've been looking at this one, and when it comes to IPOs. You have to make a decision on whether or not you want to go with the first setups, the pioneer setups, or do you want to wait for a secondary setup? And the reason that I overlooked this one, or I should say I didn't overlook it, the reason I didn't put in a trading service or trade it personally was because I just didn't feel like it had enough 
it's a Chinese music company or something, and it just didn't seem like. I mean, the Chinese kind of kind of sucked me in a little bit, but I didn't feel like it was worth going after. It didn't seem like it had enough G whiz. Not that I confuse the issue with facts, but what I'll do in a case like this is possibly wait for a secondary signal. So see if it rallies and then wait for that next pullback or whatever. Now, Mike, I know what you're looking at. You're looking at one or two things. If you're looking at, if you have the IPO course, then we have a simple pattern that just buys on a closing high, which would have been right here with a few caveats. And then the aforementioned system I was talking about was to put in a five-day moving average, which won't show up on the chart until at least, what, five days? Where'd it go? Didn't show up. There it is. All right. What happened here? Oh, it's a moving average and moving average. Oh, you can get a lot of trouble doing that. <laughs> anyway, so the other system would be that you have to have the low greater than the moving average and a new closing high, which would put you in on this day here too. Same uh, two systems, two things. So yeah, did it technically trigger that early signal? Yes. Did I take it? No, because I didn't feel like there was enough excitement there to go after. Now, maybe I might live to regret that. But you have to make a decision. And of course, what's the second part? You have to learn to live with it. So, but if this thing continues to rally and pulls back, I might go after it. I'm trying to think of another one. What was one of those? Um, Sono was another one that I wasn't too excited about taking straight out the box because they make speakers. And it's just hard for me. It was hard for me to get excited about a speaker company. And that's why I didn't go after that early trend signal. And that's what happened with that one. There was another one. It's like a Chinese electric car company, NIO. Okay. NIO is another one where I feel like, well, let this stock prove itself first. Although this move higher was pretty extreme. I just couldn't get too excited about buying it. Now, I mean, you know, there's no... It might seem like there's no rhyme or reason to it, but you have to, you know what companies are kind of a little bit too crazy to work. And it's okay to go after the secondary signal, like a speaker company. All right, they're making speakers. But Dave, have you heard these speakers? They sound great. Yeah, no, they, I'm sure they do. But is it really worth going after on a, on a pioneer signal? Okay, so what... What would I take on a Pioneer signal? Well, it has to be something like a, maybe a biotech or something like that. Maybe a weed company. You know, that, that seems to be the, the big deal now. So with something like these particular IPOs that I'm pointing out, I'm less inclined to go after those first Pioneer type of setups. All right, Donna wants to know about TBLT. Yeah, now this has become too extreme because what's the what's the jump here? And it's not going to get the full jump, but so it went up. That's 156% on a closing basis and like 300% from the high. So there was really, it's really no way to get into this thing once it makes such an extreme move. So you're better off just leaving it alone. And there's no way you would have had a, a setup down here that's something that would have gotten you into it. So you can't kiss all the women. Sometimes you have to let them go. Now, if this thing continues to rally, it begins to pull back, then it might be worth trading as a setup. But it's way too dangerous to go after this one, unless, of course, you use a four-point stop <laughs> at this juncture. So I would avoid that for now. Wait for that secondary signal. MU... This is a big, thick company. I'd be more excited about shorting a company like this than buying it. I think it's way too early to buy. Let's take a look at a weekly. So if you are going to buy a company like this, that in if it's been kind of headed lower, wait to see. Let's take a look at like a two-day chart. 
if it's coming off of multi-year lows, like in 2016 or even better, all-time lows, like in 2011, then it might be worth going after. The story I often tell about the guy who ran 5,000, a friend of mine, uh, was a friend of mine. He's no longer with us. That's a two-drink minimum. For, here was, for him, it was more than two drinks. Uh, it's, a, it's a million bucks. And then round tripped it. It was Micron was a stock that he was uh, trading. He was trading a, a shat load of options in it. Um, if anything, I think it looks like a short. One problem having now on the short side is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20 something days. Okay, a month and change of going up mostly. So it's kind of hard for me to get too excited about shorting something that's going up for almost a month. And a lot of charts are kind of screwed up because the overall market has gone up for so long. So the next leg lower looks pretty obvious to me on the short side, but it's hard for me to take these setups. Also, as I've been talking about quite a bit, and this one's not completely horrible, but if you are going to short, try to find things that are still at fairly high levels because the market itself is still at fairly high levels. And the bigger they are, the harder they fall. The higher they are, the further they have, the further they have, you try to say, to fall. All right. Any other stocks, individual stocks that you guys and girls want to look at? INSG. Um, this is one we obviously talked about last week, and I wasn't too excited about it because the whole breakout was just at one bar. It looks a little bit better now. It still kind of jumps out at me as it's kind of wide and loose and all over the place. I mean, I hear you. I would prefer if, like, if this wide range bar were somehow, let's see if we could draw on the chart and make a little more sense. I would much prefer when it comes to trading, if you have some sort of acceleration that looks like this and then a pullback, your bars get wider and wider during the breakout as opposed to a breakout where you, bar, you have one wide bar and then you know your bars kind of taper off a little bit. Now, you did have one decent bar here. But it just doesn't jump out at me as being clean enough to go after. And I, it's not, you know, not a, I have to say, good eye. But just because it's, it's had this huge takeoff in here, then it did, it did work higher, too. You can't argue with that. Uh, I think you could certainly do a lot worse. I think it would be a little bit dangerous to go after, though. Also, a little bit on the thin side, only 200 shares. Is that my average volume? It should be, if not. So I think I'd pass on that one. Any more? Quiet bunch. Keep them coming. Gold, as in barrack. Okay. Well, shorter term, which way is this headed? Shorter term... It's going down for how long? Well, let's grab the peak. So that's what, a month, six weeks? So I would not rush out and buy this stock at this juncture. It's kind of all over the place. So there's not a whole lot of goals at this point in time that are jumping out at me. So we can take a quick look at these. I mean, this one's kind of interesting, but it's a cheap stock, and it's very, very, very thin. But it is coming off of major lows, big thrust tire followed by a pullback. Let's see what else is going on. Oops. But as you go through these, there's just not a whole lot that's set up just yet. I mean, this one broke out. It's come all the way back in. Kind of bottoming now. Now, this one is kind of... Define gravity a little bit. So this looks a little bit better. I'd like to see more pullback, but that's worth putting on your momentum list. Let's go through a few more in here. This one's kind of all over the place. All over the place. Let's see if we can find something kind of clean. Q. 
KL. We'll look. We'll take a look at that one. There it is, right there. Yeah, this one's making new highs. You know, maybe on a pullback I, at this juncture, since the metals are at fairly low levels, I kind of like to try to find something that fits the sector. Okay. But yeah, I hear you on that. It's making. It's banging on new highs. This Newmont looks okay. My only problem with this one is, or new goal, I should say, is that it does have this big gap here. I guess that'd be a good problem to have if it rallied 50%. Shorter term, though, that does look kind of interesting because you made this major, major lows, thrust higher, pullback. I know it's a cheap stock, but some of these gold stocks are cheap. So that looks pretty darn good with the caveat that you got this big gap here. So I would actually toss that one out. This one looks okay, but you have a major amount of overhead supply to get through. So I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to these gold stocks, but most of them are kind of wide and loose and all over the place and just nothing to get too excited about just yet. All right, anything else? While we're at an impasse, I want to thank everybody for coming. I appreciate you taking time out of a busy schedule. Anything unanswered should be an email covered either in the week of charts or in the Q&A. I think we have a Q&A next week. All right, going once, going twice. All right, thanks again, everyone, and everybody have a great weekend if we don't talk between now and then, and hope to see all you guys and girls again next Thursday. Thank you so much.